Good morning, everyone. We want to get started so we can give Sheila all of her time because she has some very important things to say. We are so delighted to have you back, Sheila. This is a real treat for us, and it's so good to see such a great crowd here this morning. We're so thankful all of you have come, and the weather is beautiful. I tell you, we have been so blessed this whole week, and uh, it's so good to see all of you here. Be sure and register, and, and we're hoping you'll get lectureship books. There are DVDs for sale in the front of the auditorium out in, near the foyer. So we just want you to take advantage of all the, the things that we have to offer here. And of course, there's going to be lunch, so we hope you'll stay for that. And um, stay for 11 o'clock for Willie's lecture. If you heard him sing last night, you know he can sing, so <laughs> we know that he can speak too. Anyway, Sheila Butt is a very unique person. She's taught many, many, many Bible classes. And of course, she's written many, many, many books. And after her lecture, uh, Peggy Coulter uh, is going to get up here and tell you about uh, her books because she is a prolific writer. Her son, Kyle, Kyle did such a great job Sunday morning. And of course, he's a prolific writer with Apologetics Press, and they're doing su such great things there. Um, and, and this family is, is extraordinary, let me tell you. Uh, Sheila is running for state senator, representative, uh, District 64 in Tennessee. Isn't that great? I think it's on the conservative. I think so. <laughs> oh, and to get people like her in positions like that, isn't that great? That is just wonderful. I said, I wish we could vote here. <laughs> uh, she has three children, nine grandchildren, and I'm going to, to, uh, to stop right here and give her her time and so just listen up because you're in for a treat. Okay, Sheila. Okay, now, oh good, this microphone is working. And can you hear me in the back? I have taught many ladies' days where ladies came up to me afterward and said, oh, you did so good. I couldn't hear you, but you did good. <laughs> you always have to worry about what you did. But at any rate, I'm gonna ask you today to listen louder. A little boy got picked up at school by his daddy and he got in the car and his daddy said, what'd you do at school today? And the little boy says, what? Nothing. Our kids can go to school for eight hours and their pat answer is nothing. And so then the mother got in the car and she said, Johnny, what was the best thing that happened at school today? Oh, the best thing? We got to have ice cream. Oh, that's good. Johnny, what was the worst thing that happened at school today? Oh, Billy hurt his knee on the playground and had to have stitches. Well, by this time, the dad is furious. And so they got home and he said, why did you tell your mother everything and you didn't tell me anything? He said, well, Daddy, Mama just listens louder. And today, I'm going to ask you to listen louder. There are some things going on in our world today that ladies are we slow to believe? So many things come under that category. Something is happening in California this week. Proposition 8 trial underway this week in California. If the judge overturns the decision of the people in the state of California, then it will go to the Supreme Court who will decide in all of the states in the United States if gay marriage will be legal or not. So your state is not going to be able to vote for itself and say, no, as Tennessee has said, we are not going to have gay marriage in our state. But if the federal law overturns that, listen to the, finally what this said, if the ban is reversed, it would almost certainly invalidate traditional marriage laws in other states. The future of traditional marriage for the nation is at stake in this decision. Now ladies, I am asking you 
to pray for what's going on in California this week. It will affect your state. You know, we have a tendency to believe, oh, that just happens in California, or that just happens in other states, but the federal laws can change that. So I'm asking you to pray diligently this week for what is happening there. It will affect you, it will affect your children and your grandchildren. So there are so many things that we need to open our eyes about. And you know, we say, are we slow to believe? No, traditionally, Americans have not been slow to believe. As a matter of fact, we're pretty quick to believe. Most surveys say that with 90% being the highest number, 90% of people in the United States either believe in God or believe in some kind of a higher power. So there are plenty of people who are not slow to believe. It goes as high as 93%, with the lowest figure being about 78% of people who believe in God or some kind of higher power. So you see, the majority of Americans are not slow to believe. <coughs> Believing does not seem to be the problem when you just have to answer a question. But let me show you what's happening in our nation. While Americans may have firm religious commitments, they're unwilling to impose them on other people. Why aren't we evangelizing? Because Americans, for the most part, believe that your faith is as good as mine. For the most part, they say, if you believe in God, that's okay. Every aspect of our lives is a totally different thing. And I believe sometimes that that's we have not been the light and the salt in the world that we need to be. If we believe this is the ultimate truth, then we want to share it with everybody. And we want to make sure that we love people enough to tell them the truth, to want them to go to heaven. Because you see, when the time comes for you to leave this earth, you are either going to be saying goodbye to everything you love and cherish the most, or you're going to be saying hello to everything you love and cherish the most. And it's all going to depend on how you live your life. Believing in God and living like it are two different things. But the Bible says you believe in God, you do well. Even the what? Demons believe and tremble. Belief is not what it's all about. Do you see that faith without works is what? Dead. That's right. People are quick to believe. They're quick to be the seed that takes in the word of God. But you know what? When the slightest rain comes or the slightest wind, they change direction. And we need to hold to the truth of God's word. Do you see that by works, faith is made perfect, complete, and whole? If we believe in the word of God, then we have to not believe in what our society teaches as situational ethics. When our son Kyle debated Dan Barker, a noted atheist, and I don't know if he mentioned that Sunday or not, but here was a man who stood up here and said that my truth, whatever I think is right, is right. Doesn't matter what the Bible thinks, it, we don't have a standard, every person is their own individual standard. Kyle said, do you mean if you had to kill the first six people on this road to save the next 20, you would do that? He said, if I thought that was the right thing to do, I would do that. Now, anyone who believes in God could never think like that. We believe that the, our worldview is shaped by what this scripture teaches. Was it hard for even the apostles? Yes. Jesus told the apostles over and over, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. And they said, oh, no, you're not. They said when he told that story that they were even sorrowful about it. But you know what? When he actually died and came back, they didn't believe it. How many times they said, look at Matthew 17, if you'll go there with me for just a moment. Matthew 17, let's, let's look at verses 22 and 23. He told them over and over, now when they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And you know what happened after Jesus was raised? He kept coming, and people would say everywhere he went, they told that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and they did not believe him, even after they had been told over and over. And ladies, we can't be those kind of people. We have the word, and we know the truth of that word, and we need to be teaching the truth of this word. One little boy came out of Bible class not long ago. I said, John Allen, what was your Bible class about? He said, it was the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I said, oh, John Allen, that is such a great true story. And those little brown eyes got big. 
And he said, Miss Sheila, is that a true story? Ladies, what are we teaching in our Bible class? Are we spending 30 minutes coloring a coat of many colors, which is one line in the story of the life of Joseph? Or are we taking the Bible? Do you know that so I'm tired of videos in the Bible class? I'm sorry. But the children need to know that this is the word of God. The stories in this book are not veggie tales. The story in this book are true stories. And we are wasting our Bible class time by teaching our young people about coloring the coat of many colors. They get enough of that in secular education, so what if they stay in the lines? We want them to stay in the lines of the truth. And we've got to do that in our Bible classes. You only have 30 minutes, 35 minutes. The story of Joseph is a young man who was mistreated by his brothers, thrown into a pit. Now, ladies, I raised three boys. I can picture that happening. <laughs> I can picture Cliff and Stan throwing Kyle in a pit. And I can picture Kyle saying, oh, this is just a bad joke. My brothers will be back to get me. I'm sure this is just a bad joke. And then they didn't come. And when they did come back, they sold Joseph into slavery. Now what's he thinking? He's thinking, my dad will come get me now. I know my dad will come. Did his dad ever come? No. Well, my dad must not love me either. But through all of these horrendous circumstances, what did Joseph do? He stayed faithful to that's the story of Joseph. And then he was rewarded for that. And that's the story that will sustain your children when they go through the darkness of their life. That's the story that will sustain them when they come to your funeral. That's the story that will sustain them when there's divorce and things that happen in their life that they can't control. They need to know the story of Joseph and the truth of that story. One little boy came out and he said, had a picture of David. And I said, what did you study in your class? He said, oh, we studied David. He said, and you know what? I'm going to see David when I go to heaven. Now that little boy is getting the Bible teaching. I'm begging you not to be so entrenched in all of the things that go along with the Bible study. Study the Bible. We had a little girl in our class Sunday morning, had just been baptized a couple of weeks ago. Both of her parents have been deployed to Iraq. There are three children left with a niece in that family. A little girl's about 11, one about 9, a little boy about 3. Now they're left with their niece who goes to a denominational church and she's left with her now for a year while her parents are serving in Iraq. She was in our Bible class Sunday morning and I just hugged her. I said, oh, Victoria, I'm so glad to see you here. She said, well, I had to ask my grandparents if I could come with them. Because, you see, when I go to that other church, we sing songs, and, and we see a video, and we have candy, but we don't study the Bible much there. What's going to help that little girl get through her parents being gone for a year in Iraq? Her God. And that's what we need to give our children. If we don't believe it ourselves, then we can't teach it. Teach the truth of God's word. What about Samson? Was Samson the strongest man in the Bible? Oh, he was. Physically. Was Samson the strongest man in the Bible emotionally? Thank you. No. Was he the strongest man in the Bible spiritually? No. Samson wasn't the strongest man in the Bible. As a matter of fact, he was one of the weakest. God had probably intended for Samson to be a much stronger judge than he ever turned out to be. Why? Because of his sinful lust for women whom God had said don't marry those women. His parents said don't marry those women. But Samson was going to do it his way, wasn't he? That's the story of Samson. Let's make sure that we tell our children the truth. And don't be ashamed to turn off the video and pick up the Bible and read the story from the Word of God. That's what will sustain them when they're in the back seat of a car with a young man or a young woman someday. When Joseph said, how can I sin against 
against my parents? No. Against my brothers? No. How can I sin against God that's right? That's what we need to give our children. That's what we need to give the children in our Bible classes. A belief that acts every day in their life. Not just something that says, oh, I believe. Because that faith without works is dead. There are many people who, like the disciples, are going to be surprised on the day of judgment. You see, when Jesus came back, they were actually surprised. We have many people in this world who are going to be surprised when God comes back and Jesus comes back at judgment. Because, oh yeah, they believed, but just not enough to do the right thing. He began to, when Christ was doing many mighty works in the synagogues and all throughout the territory, but what happened when he got to his own territory at home? He couldn't do many works, could he? Why? Because there were people there who did not believe. But let me submit to you this. There are plenty of people that if you showed them one thing, guess what they'd want? Something else. You know, Dan Barker asked Kyle, he said, uh, Kyle, if you could tell me that God was going to come back at 12.01 on Wednesday night, such and such, then I would believe. Kyle said, no, you wouldn't. He said, because you would ask for one more piece of evidence. And there are plenty of people who will not take the truth and who will say, okay, well then just give me one more piece of evidence. And those people, according to the scriptures, are not slow to believe. Do you know what this scripture calls them? Fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now many times in the scriptures there were tragic consequences for unbelief. Remember why the Israelites had to, for 40 years, wander in the wilderness? Because of their what? Unbelief. Belief. God said because of their evil hearts of unbelief. Now Abraham is a great example to us of someone who believed in God even when it took what? A long time, didn't it? Abraham waited on the promise of God, we're told in Romans chapter 4 verse 20, for many years until he saw it fulfilled. Now ladies, I know most of you are like me. We pray and we pray and we want God to do it what? Right now, thank you. We do, don't we? We're so impatient. And then it says, and then he was asked by God to sacrifice his only son, and he never wavered through unbelief. Have any of you ever thought about what it would feel like to take one of your children up there and sacrifice your child? Why, some of us aren't even willing to take him away from a ball game on a Wednesday night much less raise our hand to kill them to sacrifice to our God. Abraham never wavered in his belief, even when it was not in his own time. Go with me to the book of Job for just a moment, please. I want to show you something. It would be so easy to be a Christian if we never had to wait for these things. If God said, okay, you get that and you get to have it now, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't everybody be wanting to be a Christian? But let me show you something about Job in Job chapter 1, verse 1. Job loved God. And because of what a good man he was, he was tormented. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Oh, that that could be said about us. Wouldn't you love to have all four of those things said about you? But because of that, look what happened in Job's life. Because he was blameless, because he was upright, because he was a man who feared God, and Satan said, I want him. And he's going to want you. And he's going to want your family if you truly believe what the Bible teaches. When those times come, ladies, wait Go to James chapter 5 with me for just a moment, please. This is so encouraging to me. Do you ever have times in your life when something tragic happens and you feel like that song that says, my heart is hard, my soul so weak. Is your soul ever weak? Mine is. Sometimes my soul is weak. And like the man who brought his epileptic son to Christ 
And Jesus said, if you believe, he'll be healed. And what did the man say? Help my unbelief. Have you ever had to ask God to help your unbelief? Maybe he's put a rock in the middle of your road and you can't go around it and you can't go over it and you can't control it and you can't do one thing about it. And you say, God, what is this? This is not the plate I ordered. Did you ever get a plate you didn't order? God, I didn't order this. I can't even move it. It's just sitting in my life. I can't go around it. I can't go over it. I can't go through it. And you say, God, help my unbelief. You take your unbelief to God. And you may be sitting there right now with that rock in the middle of your life. God will show you the end eventually. Wait. Look at James chapter 5. Look at verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. That word patience, when you say Job has patience, you're not saying Job has the patience to raise five children. You're saying Job had endurance. He waited it out. And sometimes, ladies, that's what we have to do. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen what? The end intended by the Lord. I'm going to tell you today that the end of Job's life that was intended by the Lord is different than the end of his life that was intended by Satan. And he had to wait for the end that was intended by God. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Have you prayed lately for the mercy of God in your life? Have you prayed for the mercy of God for your family, for your congregation? Because, ladies, I don't care how much you think you have it together. You need the mercy of God. Job waited. You know, it's kind of like we're living our lives in a video. And right now, we're living this frame right here today. This is a good frame. This is a good frame. Because we're together with our sisters in Christ. We're together with people of like mind. We're together with people that we are going to spend eternity with. This is a good frame. Tomorrow might be a bad frame. The day after Thanksgiving, one of the most active men in our congregation, with two boys aged, I would say, 11 and 13, was deer hunting. We have loved this family. We got a call. And Troy had fallen out of the deer stand. Had been lying there for over three hours. Could not move. Troy's 42 years old. We went, went to Vanderbilt that night. He had broken his neck in two places. They put a bar in and they said, we don't know. We went to Atlanta last week to see Troy. He's in a rehab place there. He can only move his head. We looked down and he said, look, I can move my hand a little bit. And he was so happy just to be able to move that hand a little bit. This is a man who the day before that accident had every motion, every movement, had been athletic. That's a bad frame he's living in, isn't it? you have to wait till the end of the video and see the good that can come out of those things. If you believe in God and you trust him. When I talked with her last Friday and we went to visit them and she said, you know what, Sheila? When I get really down, I go upstairs and I visit the neurology ward. And she said, these are people who have been in accidents, and they can move, and they can walk miles, but they don't know their wife, they don't know their children, they don't know their parents. She said, that's worse. I don't care how bad you ever think you have it, there's always somebody who's got it worse than you. 
Ladies, be patient. Make your belief active in your life. And at those moments that you feel like you have some unbelief, do you not think for a moment that Troy and Angie haven't thought, why did this happen to us? Father, what is this about? What is this rock in the middle of the road? But endure. Your belief has to be strong enough for you to endure to see the end of the video. And I'm begging you ladies to do that and to help your families do that. Don't be the one that gets down and depressed and feeling like everything is on you. Take that to the Lord and then get up and stand up and walk out of that room and help the next person who needs you. Strong Christian women can do that. In one of the books I wrote, I had a little paragraph that said, uh, God cannot use whining women. And I believe that. But James called me and said, Sheila, you really can't say that. Because God can use anybody he wants to. And if he wants to use a whining woman, I guess he can. And so I had to take that out of there. Because I guess if God wants to use a whining woman, he will. He'll use anybody he wants to. He used a donkey. I guess he can use anybody he wants to. <laughs> but ladies, we do not, women of faith do not need to be whining women. We need to get on the floor, cry to God, scream to God, whatever it takes, and then stand up and walk out of that room with your head held high and live for the end of the video. Now I'm asking all of us to do that. When your faith is weakest, take it to the Father. What is another thing we can do when we have weak faith? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when your faith is weak, go hear a good preacher. When your faith is weak, open your Bible and let God talk to you. See, so many pre people think prayer is so important, and I, would, I believe prayer is extremely important. But I also believe when you're praying, you are talking to God. But when you are reading his word, he is talking to you. So when your faith is ever weak, you go to the word of God. Find out the truth in God's word. Don't let your life be ruled by your emotions, ladies. And we are very good at doing that. We women just have this emotional side that sometimes we let rule our lives. Sometimes we blame it on hormones. Sometimes it actually is hormones. And sometimes you might need to have that checked. But we do not need to let our emotions rule our lives. 3 plus 3 will never equal 12. I don't care how compassionate you are. I don't care if you say, oh, yeah, but that little boy thinks it does, so we're going to make it all right. No, ma'am. Right is right. And we cannot let our lives be ruled by our emotions. Not long ago, I went into Columbia to the shoe shop there. And there is a man who fixes my husband's boots. Now, my husband... We won't go into the boot story, but I never thought I would marry a man who wore cowboy boots with pointed toes, ever. And now, if he was here today preaching, he'd have on his cowboy boots with his pointed toes. And he'll pay quite a lot for those boots, but then they'll last him for 10 or 15 years because I take them to the shoe shop, and the healer puts heels on his boots. Well, this particular day, I went in, and I said, how are you today? Noticed a lot of Bible tracks around, and he said, Sheila, did you know I'm a healer? I said, you're a healer? Well, I know you put the heels on the boots. He said, no, I'm a healer. I heal people. I said, you do? He said, yes. I said, well, why aren't you working at the hospital? I mean, if I could heal people, would I not be at the hospital? Of course I would. He said, well, I can only do it if the Spirit moves me. Okay, I would go sit in the waiting room until the Spirit moved me, and I would go to the children's ward, and I would heal every child in that ward. I got a letter from a magazine that wanted me to write about miracles for them. And I was excited. I thought, yes, I can write about miracles. I can't wait. Well, the first thing they wanted me to write about was an everyday miracle. Now, what exactly is an everyday miracle? Now, I did hear about a lady who went to her doctor and she had gained eight pounds that month. He said, honey, how have you gained eight pounds in one month? She said, well, you know I eat healthy. She said, I do. I eat my broccoli sprouts. I eat everything. He said, I eat Brussels sprouts, broccoli. You know I eat healthy, doctor. But last month, a dairy queen moved in our neighborhood. 
And she said, have you ever had one of those hot fudge cakes, you know, whatever they are? It has that chocolate cake, and then there's some hot syrup, and then there's some whipped cream and ice cream with a cherry on top. He said, yes, I know what you're talking about. She said, well, every day after lunch, I drive to the Dairy Queen, and I get a hot fudge cake. He said, okay, honey, you cannot do that. Now listen to me. You're going to have to try not to eat that hot fudge cake every day. She said, okay. She came back a month later and had gained four more pounds. He said, I had asked you not to eat so much of that hot fudge cake. What are you doing? She said, well, I'm going to just tell you, doctor. I went home and I prayed that if I was not supposed to eat that hot fudge cake, that there would not be a parking plot place at the Dairy Queen the next day. So she said, I went the next day, and after I drove around nine times, there was a parking place. You see, I don't believe there's a miracle that's an everyday miracle. Do I believe in the providence of God? Anybody that knows me knows I do. Do I believe that there's somebody watching out for those who will inherit salvation? I believe that. Have I ever met them personally? No. Because the best evidence that miracles are not happening today is that miracles are not happening today. <laughs> there is not anybody at the hospital raising those children. There is not anybody taking leukemia away. There's not anybody taking cancer away. So anyway, I thought, okay, I can, uh, let's see what else I can write about. Then they said miracles at Christmas and miracles and all these miracles. And then they said, the stories must tell how you changed during the experience. Cannot have much scripture or be overly religious. Tell me how I would write about a miracle without being religious or using much scripture. Because what did they want me to write about? My feelings my emotions. Now, if you think people are slow to believe, sometimes it's because belief is based on emotions. Dan Barker will occasionally bring a glass of his urine to a debate. And he will tell the audience, pray that God will change this urine into water. And then he'll ask them to pray. And then at the end of the debate, and he'll debate them all night long, and they'll say, yes, miracles do happen today. Yes, God is doing that today. Then he will say at the end of the debate to the other debater, will you drink this water? And immediately what happens? Everybody's deflated. That urine didn't change to water. But that's his way of saying, you are basing your belief on your feelings, and it will never stand, ladies. Your faith has got to be based on the truth of God's word. God doesn't say, come let us feel this together. He says, come let us reason together. Do you understand, when I was studying to teach evidences, that I read articles that said every textbook in your child's classroom is only true for the year in which it is written. Let that sink in. If a textbook is five years old, it doesn't have much truth in it anymore. Why? Because truth changes in our culture. How does the truth change in our culture? When I was growing up in high school, I was told that by today, right here in Texas and across the United States of America, there was going to be an ice age. The United States was supposed to be covered in ice. Now what do we have in global warming, which I guarantee you will change within the next three years. The truth of our culture that our science even teaches as truth will only be true for a short time. We've changed the number of planets. We've changed the uh, number on our uh, scale of minerals. We've changed over the years. All of that science changes. But God says, my word is true. And if you truly are not slow to believe, then every time you make a decision, you're going to go to the truth and find it out. Now, how else does the truth change in our society? I'll tell you another way it changes. It depends on what attorney has his say in the courtroom. doesn't necessarily have anything to do with truth. Uh, Kyle had been in an accident not long ago. He called and he said, Mom, I'm running late. We've been in an accident. The lady came over to my car and said, Oh, I'm so sorry I ran into you. So by Monday morning, when I talked to him on the phone, I said, well, Kyle, how is everything? He said, well, Mother, guess what? That lady called, 
and she says she's talked to her insurance company, and she didn't run into me at all. I must have run into her. <laughs> now, how did that truth change? Because of the insurance company. We are being spoon-fed things that are not true. If we truly believe the Bible, then that is going to be the truth that sustains our entire worldview. I heard a man on TV the other day talking about a $70 miracle. I thought, what is he talking about? If you would send him $70 for 70 weeks, you were going to have a miracle in your life. Some of us, it would be a miracle if we had extra $70 for 70 weeks, wouldn't it? But, I, you know, it's just unbelievable the way we use God's Word out of context, without any reason, and build an emotional religion on it. Ladies, study the word from the beginning to the end. If you really want to increase your faith, it can only be done by a careful study of God's word. Do you remember the builders in Matthew? The wise man, he heard what God said, and he did it. The other builder heard what God said. He heard exactly the same thing. But, you know, he thought, nah, I think I could do a little better. I think I'll put a ramp over here. Oh, you know, I think the house would look better if I do this. You see, he was going to do it his way. Go to Mark chapter 10 with me for just a moment, please. Let's look at something. It's very important. We need to understand that we cannot do it our way. If we truly believe in God, we're going to go to the Word and do what he says. Uh, Mark 10, look at verse 17. Now, as he was going out, they call him the rich young ruler, one came running, knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's Mark 10, verse 17. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that that rich young ruler would have run out there for God to tell him what he was going to tell him that day? Would he have been excited? Would he have said, Oh, I can't wait to run out there and see Jesus. He's going to tell me to give up everything I have. No. He ran out there, most likely excited because he thought Jesus was going to say, you have done great. See, he was excited to see Jesus. So Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now look, six things, and this young man had done them all. How do you think his head is feeling right now? Oh, boy, I have done good. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Look at verse 21. I love this verse. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved. If you met Jesus on the road, wouldn't you like to have that said about you? Jesus looked at her and he loved her. And said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. Wait a minute. There was one thing this young man lacked. He had done all those other things. Is there one thing that I lack? Is there one thing that you lack? Because if there's something that you love more than God, you better find it. And you better find a way to tell God you can have it. This young man was not willing to do that. But he was sad at this word. And he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Go to Matthew chapter 7, please, with me for just a moment. Because, you see, there are so many people who say, Oh, yes, I want to go to heaven, but I want to do it my way. How many of you have a GPS system in your car? I'll never forget the first time I got that GPS. That, my GPS was bossy. Now, I don't know about yours, but mine had an attitude. My GPS, if I missed the turn, would say, route recalculation. I mean, she wasn't even nice about it. She was kind of hateful to you. And then if you didn't turn in, she would say, take the next right 300 yards. And I thought, boy, she just has an attitude, doesn't she? <laughs> so the night we were driving along, and uh, uh, Kyle called, and 
Kyle said, what's dad doing? I said, well, he's arguing with the GPS right now. I mean, they were just having a regular ongoing argument. He wasn't going to turn there, and she kept telling him to turn there. Because that GPS wants you to do it her way or his way, don't they? And there are plenty of people who think they're going to go to heaven doing it their way. And I'm going to submit to you that if you think that, then you are slow to believe what this book teaches. Because John 12, 48 says, my words will condemn you in the last day. We can only go by the words of God. Go as close to this book as you can and let this book bring you into relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you see, if you only have the word, then you're a legalist. If you use this word, without having the love of Jesus Christ in your heart, then you may as well be a scribe or a Pharisee. You see, this book was intended to bring us into relationship with Jesus Christ. Recently, I was visiting a congregation, and the preacher said somebody came up to him and said, Are you a heart church or a book church? Indicating that you can't be a heart church. Christians are all about the book, and Christians are all about the heart. And if you have to make sure that when you study this word, you're doing it with the motive of being brought into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who <coughs> does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? Have we not written stories in your name? Have we not done miracles in your name? Have we not done $70 miracles in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness. Ladies, we have to believe, and we have to believe what God wants us to do. Now, I'm convinced that if back in the 1950s there had been such thing as ultrasound, that we would have never had abortion like we have it today. Why? Because you could see the babies. I never had an ultrasound in my life. If I heard a heartbeat, that was awesome. Now you can see your baby's profile in just a very few weeks. I have a friend who said he watched his twins playing together in the womb. That's awesome. Had we had that kind of technology when the decision of Roe v. Wade had come down, that decision would not have been made because you could see the truth. Ladies, we can see the truth. God has giving up, given us the word. It is plainly written. It is intended to bring us into relationship with Christ. And if you are slow to believe, there is no Let's pray. Our great God and King, we worship, praise, and honor you on this day. Father, what a joy to be in a room full of women who love you. Father, I'm asking you to bring every one of us into closer relationship with you and with each other. And Father, I'm praying that we'll go back to our congregations and build relationship with the people in our congregation so that we may weather the storms of life grounded in the truth and love of your word. Father, yes, there are those who are slow to believe. But when the time comes, Father, let us be the ones that they see living in this world to glorify you. And when they look at us, let, us, let them see Christ living in us and let them want to know how to share eternity with you. Father, forgive us when we stumble. Be merciful to us in the decisions that we make that aren't always right. But, Father, may our motives always be pure and lovely and honest and just. And, Father, we thank you for every spiritual gift. And we thank you for the greatest gift of all, your beloved Son, in whom we live and move and have our very being. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.